Hello and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental enthusiasts, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Laura and I discuss the hazards of field work. We talk to Erica Moulton about the Center of Open Exploration, Women in STEM, and Antarctica. And finally, I actually have a question for you instead, Laura. What is the largest desert in the world? Sahara. That is second. Hmm. I'll give you a hint. I already said it in the intro. And maybe Erica talks about it too. Cool. <laughs> it's an, well, it is cool. I agree. Antarctica is actually technically the largest oh. desert in the world. Because it's really just more about rainfall than anything else or preci- precipitation. Right. So right. it does not rain there. <laughs> and it's effectively barren. It's a desert. But yeah, we just don't think of it that way because, uh, you know, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, how about that? You know, I thought that was pretty fun. Interesting. Yeah. Facts about Antarctica. Okay. Don't ask Laura a question again. Got it. All right. <laughs> I'm like deer in the headlights. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm just picturing like, okay, it's a desert with penguins instead of camels. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. It just doesn't, you know, it's not like we know. It's like, oh, yeah, it rains there all the time. No, definitely not. It's It's very, very dry. It's like one of the, it's not the driest desert in the world, but it's one of them. It's pretty high up. there. So how about that? We all learned something today. Yeah. I don't remember learning that in school. <laughs> I don't think I did either, honestly. So. Anyway, hit that music. All right, folks, it's that time of year again. Come join us for the 2023 NAAP Annual Conference and Training Symposium in Phoenix, Arizona from May 7th to 10th. Enthusiastic environmental professionals like ourselves from across the country gather each year at the NAAP conference to share the opportunity to learn about projects, share technical knowledge, network with industry professionals like ourselves, and mm-hmm. engage with leaders in environmental technologies and practice. Check it out at NAAP.org. All right, Nick. So finally. We have sponsors coming up because Mm. someone literally said, I will sponsor. So Nick doesn't have to do this. (laughs) (laughs) Are you serious? Yes. So it's working. Uh, But anyway, we don't have a sponsor today. So ready, 30 seconds. Go. All right. You know, um, there's a a craze uh, sweeping the nation and it's uh, mustaches, right? And I'm sure we all (laughs) wish that we could all grow lustrous and full mustaches. Um, and so don't worry, Laura, I have a solution for you. It's called stash for life. That's right. It is a mustache. <laughs> All you have to do is apply the paste and scream because it will burn. Um, but once it's in there, it will be lush, full, wonderful. <laughs> Definitely won't look like someone drew a tattoo on your, on your lip. That's ridiculous. Um, and anyone that says that is lying. Um, I'm telling you, this is going to revolutionize the way we look at everyone, not just men. Anyone can get a mustache, as we all know. <laughs> so why not embrace the trend? Dive full in. They definitely never go out of style. So there we go. Stash for life. Three easy payments. I was like right on the line. 30 seconds. Ding, ding, ding. I was like, I was like yeah, I didn't hear the, the bell. I was like, oh, I had to Well, go. I was about to, I was like, you know what? He's almost done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not buying that product. So let's get to our segment. We talk a lot about you know, working in the field and the joys and the wonders of doing so. I don't know if we've spent a whole lot of time talking about it, the challenges, and some of the scary things that can happen. Oh, well, I think we have. We like Wes, yeah. Wes, Wes's story. Yeah. Wes, his yeah. story was uh, after the fact funny, but yeah. uh, during, during so much, not funny. Um, you know, you have your snake stories that we all, we all have our snake stories from being I, from Florida. We all have our alligator stories. I was about to say, I, uh, I got bit <laughs> right in the butt by a dog you know, field work, you know, it was pretty fun. And I'm lying because it was not. (laughs) (laughs) Whose dog was it? It was, we were surveying, you know, along a road and I have no idea. It was somebody's dog, like the neighbor, I think it was that closest house's dog, but the big dog that one scared me to death. Yeah. It wasn't great. I was surprised by it, but it was just a nip. And then, you know, realizing that the dog's, you know, going to be like that and you just don't turn your back to them again. But you know, that was, uh, that was fun. So it's like, you know what? I think we're done with this wetland delineation right now. Um, I think we're, we're set. We were leaving anyway, but it was kind of like, uh, ah, man, it was not fun. I did not enjoy that. But it happens, you know? Like, I, I think we've talked about injuries in the field, you know? Knocked myself out by myself, you know, very foolish. What? When did that happen? 
Did I not tell this story? Oh, I don't remember gosh. this one. So it was when I was doing it in grad school and I was doing like, I was using a radio thing to try to find box turtles, you know, to do. It was like, oh, yep, you're still there. Great. And so there was like one spot and, you know, it's, it's, there's a wetland near, you know, a huge wetland here because the lake basically had been drained and returned to its original state, which was just a big swampy wetland. So forest on either side, wetland in the middle. And I'm kind of on the edge of the wetland. So I'm just trying, trying, trying to go from one bank to the other. And I see like, you know, Japanese stilt grass, you know, invasive, by the way. So I'm even worse. I'm very angry about this story. It's all the same height, right? And so I, by myself, foolishly think that the ground is also all the same height. And so I'm walking towards a down to like, you know, ancient oak tree had fallen over. And so I'm walking towards that. And then I take a step, what I think is going to be level ground. And it's actually two feet deeper. So I fly forward and my hands and oh, no. the tree. And then I wake up, you know, seconds later, I'm pretty sure <laughs> staring at the sky, you know, like, well, that was dumb, <laughs> you know, but, it, you know, and, and it's kind of like the, that's the life lesson. Like always have someone with you. Yeah. Always. That's where I learned it. I should have known it, but I was like, ah, I'll be fine. And there you go. Oh yeah. I used, well, we used to do this water monitoring events a couple times a month and we would have to walk out on planks to get to the equipment that was a few feet out in the water. So it was checking Mm -hmm. um, levels and turbidity and stuff. And we would go out by ourselves and I, when I became a manager, I was like, no, we're not going out by ourselves anymore. And all they cared about was how much it cost to have two people go. And I was like, no, uh-uh. it's, it's sometimes these lot. waters were raging and yeah. the, the shorelines were always eroding. And I'm like, no, my staff are not going out by themselves doing this. No, oh, it's, it's a, it could end up, you know, someone could die, you know, yeah. the, hazard, the hazards of field work. You really could lose your life doing it. It is not a joke. It's really hard work sometimes. Yeah. People do die. I think I remember being terrified on a boat one time we were doing one of our boat runs in Tampa Bay and, you know, Florida storms, they come up real fast out of nowhere. Lots of thunder, lightning, sometimes hail. And my coworker is just like driving full speed in a whiteout. And I'm like, um, no, no, I was terrified. Like I could feel us like hitting a barge or something like any second. I was like, stop. Um, That's the worst part for me when you're in the field with someone who doesn't have the same or like, you know, doesn't respect your level of uh, respect for safety. Mm -hmm. That's how people get injured. It's how people die. It's really scary stuff. And yeah, it's like I say, there's, there's lots of fun things that happen, but yeah, there's, there's real, real danger out there. But you know, it's like, you know, the simple things like small stuff like turning your ankle in the middle of a forest by yourself. It's terrible. Like one of my friends tore her Achilles on her own Ooh. in the middle of a forest and had to crawl her way back out. You know, it's, you know, she survived, you know, she's alive. But if she had someone with her, that ordeal becomes far less horrible. Right. Yeah. Like when I sprained my ankle in the field, <laughs> I yeah. would not have wanted to be alone. Right. No way. Uh, and, you know, I think we've all done something like that, right? step on a rock funny <laughs> and there it goes right it's um, it yeah but i don't know anyone with a story like erica's so oh. let's get into her interview and whatever you do listeners stay tuned welcome back to epr today we have erica moulton stem director at st Petersburg college and antarctic explorer <laughs> welcome erica hi great to be here thanks for having me well, I'm super excited to have you here. I've been dying for you to meet Nick because you check all of his envy boxes. Oh. <laughs> Antarctic adventures, diving, amazing career history, going back to diving starting at 13. And you're pretty good at social media posts, which he sucks at. So <laughs> <laughs> she's not wrong. Too funny. <laughs> um, but I think I met you maybe for the first time when we were planning women in STEM with TBAP. Um, like eight years ago or something. Yeah, which is I was crazy. Gonna say it had to be in the eight to ten year range for sure. Right, because now they're on their eighth or so workshop, which is really yeah. exciting. Yeah. Um, so, but that at that time, I remember I think that was when the center that you're working at also just opened. So, um, tell us about the STEM lab at St. Pete College and uh, what programs do you have there? Sure. So, 
St. Petersburg College, about that time frame, was building a STEM center, and I quite hadn't gotten the job just yet. So this coming October will be my sixth year here, but I was well aware of it being built. I was in the process of looking for a career change, and I kind of, you know, kept my eye on the prize and monitored the progress here. So essentially, it's a single standalone campus, separate from our main campuses within the college. And the center is essentially a building on stilts and a humongous outdoor classroom. It's 50 acres containing tons of different examples of microhabitats from a pine upland to a mangrove to estuaries to seagrass beds to oysters. Yeah, so we have a lagoon out here um, at the college owns the submerged land rights. A lot of local mariners would know it as Hurricane Hole. It's definitely a place where people sort of stash their boats in an incoming storm, but we've restored it over the past um, years that I've been here through some federal, local, and private funding. We've removed derelict vessels. We've removed seawall. We removed invasive plants. We've reintroduced animals. And so we have students studying that all the time. And then we have two classrooms here and then a community room and then a lab slash research room. So full complement of sort of the experience you might get if you were in a graduate program someplace else or a small private college that had the opportunity to really focus on their undergraduates. So really focused on our four-year degree-seeking students and the opportunity to give them an internship, hands-on research experience. And since St. Petersburg College is not a research institute, our faculty get to do research because they want to, not necessarily because they have to. And it's a real neat opportunity for our small class size students to be involved in really cool hands-on stuff. And then we partner with tons of community organizations from Moat Marine Lab to Clearwater Marine Aquarium, Keep Pinellas Beautiful, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, the National Estuary Program, and then lots of community organizations who come out and help us with cleanups. Tampa Bay Rays have been out here. Know Before, which is a big computer company in town. Raymond James, just the list goes on and on. So in the past year and a half, two years with the projects we've done out here, we've had Almost 800 individual volunteers who've given us about 2,700 hours of their time, and they represent 10 different organizations outside of the college who've worked on things out here at the STEM Center. So it's a pretty unique campus, a really fun opportunity, and something you don't normally find at a community four-year program. Yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah. That building is so beautiful with all the windows. It's gorgeous. You can see yeah. the lagoon and all the yeah, pine gorgeous. trees and everything out there. There's a reason yeah. that all of my windows are away from my <laughs> like, <laughs> <I have to laughs> focus board right at the wall because otherwise, and there's a bald eagle nest out here. They have they're monitored by Audubon. They have babies every year. I mean, it's ridiculous. So the dolphins outside. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a horrible place to have an office yeah. <laughs> and try to be productive. So you got to face the you got to face the wall. Otherwise, you won't no. get done. I got to ask. I mean, like, can we sit on? We have a lagoon for just like a minute. Yeah. That's that's a cool thing to say. It's just yeah. like you know, no big deal. I mean, we've got some stuff. I mean, we've got a lagoon. No big deal. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that's it's really a pretty incredible. impressive body of water. Yeah, it's now a non-motorized vessel entrance. So there's only, you know, one entrance, one exit, the same way in and out of this body of water. I mean, only averages about eight to 10 feet in depth. I see manatees and dolphins and shorebirds and all that yeah, come in yeah. all the time, lots of fish. So it's passive. You know, we have kayaks and canoes and paddle boards and things like that. So, you know, anybody's welcome to kayak in. But yeah, for our students, we have kayaks and it's a pretty neat place. Yeah. That's I have to come visit next time. Unique I'm down. opportunity. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's <laughs> super cool. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, kayaking. I love it. Right. So you've been there for six years now and working with the students in these programs. What program, what career, not career, degree programs are they in? And what kind of work, how do you help them? Are you just teaching? Are you doing, leading these projects? How are you? Sure. So here, um, I'm the director of the center, right? So that means I'm the highest administrator on this campus. So that means everything from like, you know, a light bulb out to like the printer not working. (laughs) Uh, Somebody's got to be the responsible party. So that's me. But in the big picture, our faculty self-select to teach here. So most of them, this is not their main campus. This is actually nobody's main campus except for, you know, mine and the other staff that help keep the building running. But they self-select to teach one of their courses here. So more like a contextualized curriculum. So if you were going to teach a literature course here, you would teach it, but in the line of STEM thinking. So one of our faculty has taught that course here. Dr. Shelby Rosengarten teaches the class 
So they start with a reading of Thoreau and a walk in the woods, and then they go on a walk in the woods. So it's this contextualized curriculum within the space that you're here. And it's a really unique opportunity for anyone who's going to teach a class here or to take a class to kind of answer that question about like, all right, I want to be an environmental scientist. Why am I taking history? Well, you know, (laughs) the study of maps could potentially lead you to discovering a Spanish galleon. If you understand and interpret you know, GIS data, you can actually help map and protect and preserve other spaces. And so can you read and can you write? Those are all vital to communicating your science. And so the opportunity to have those classes here is really unique. So different faculty from different campuses teach here every semester. And then of course, um, as you would expect, we do have classes that are more aligned with field studies, right? So a sampling methods class or an independent research class, microbiology class, those kinds of things that would fit into a normal kind of sciencey sort of building, as you would think. Cool. Um, can you can you say one more thing for me again? Sure. Uh, the um, reading and writing is what? Yes. What is it? Reading and writing? Yeah. Super important. Oh, uh, yeah. For, right. For yeah. Yes. 100% agree. Yeah. With communicating that. science, right? It's really agree. hard. It's really hard to figure out a way to tell people why your science is important. And yeah, it's definitely a challenge every day. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if you are a biologist and you can write well. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah, call for me. sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> for sure. I'm actually working on that project with one of my students right now. We're actually reading science journal articles to take the information about gopher tortoises and why burrow aprons, the big sandy pit that surrounds the gopher tortoise burrow, why it's important ecologically for other species. And we've been monitoring the field cameras data for months and months and months. And actually previous students have too. And we've presented at the basis conference with the estuary program. But now we're looking at trying to create some journal articles that are not scientific based, but more layman terminology to get people to understand why gopher tortoise burrows are important. And it's not just the tortoise that's using them and what's left behind. And maybe we shouldn't fill that hole in because even if the tortoise isn't there, there's other critters that are still using it. And now we have photographic and video evidence of that here. That is the coolest. Okay, she works with turtles too. You didn't tell me that, Laura. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Look, I couldn't fit all of the envy things in the very first sentence, but yes, there's That's more. So cool. That was oh, the start more. of my career. That was the start of my career. Yeah. So I started, I really looked at graduate school doing work with sea turtles. And um, I worked with Dr. Peter Pritchard. And the goal really was to do documentation of sea turtles and their presence in habitat in Guyana. And his work with Arawak Amerindians. And then when I got there the first time, I absolutely just fell in love with the ethnographic approach of trying to understand how this indigenous group of people chose to practice conservation methods. Whereas in the rest of the world, we've had non-governmental organizations or volunteer organizations from the United States go to different countries and say, like, please stop eating the turtles and here's how to practice conservation. And so they've all been sort of managed by exterior forces. And I got really enamored by the fact that the folks there were practicing conservation of their own volition, which is really the way that it should happen. So I didn't focus so much on the turtles as I did end up focusing on the people and interaction with conservation. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, my so when I went to grad school, I worked with box turtles. And, oh, cool. And honestly, you know, part of what we were doing is wildlife management, but the other half of it was also about kind of like the, you know, the, the snazzy terms conservation medicine, right? Where, mm-hmm. What we do, how does that impact? animals mm-hmm. in the wild from a health standpoint so right. yeah i totally i love that kind of holistic approach to things because it's you're right they're they're very connected to each other whether we mm-hmm. we ignore Absolutely. it then we're not doing well, it. particularly in places where they have been a food source traditionally so yeah fascinating yeah absolutely so yeah I'm excited. Okay. I know it's your turn, Laura. Go ahead. No, it's all, it's all good. I, I don't even know where to start with Erica. There's just so much stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I guess you mentioned your Guyana experience. I'm looking back at like your college choices and your degree choices and the work you did at those programs. Like, how did you, you started diving when you were 13. Were you already uh-huh. into environmental stuff? And then you, or did you, like, I accidentally landed in biology. So oh, like, did gotcha. you know what so you wanted I grew to do? Up here. You wanted to do the cool stuff? Yeah, no, I grew up here in St. Petersburg. Oh, I did um, too. My, yeah. <laughs> my parents' home was over near Whedon Island. And at that time, there was still, you know, a larger number of dirt roads. And so my parents' house was at the end of a dirt road and the only houses on one side of the street and then the mangrove estuary of Wheaton Island on the other side. And so, you know, I also grew up in a time where he sort of went out the front door and didn't come back till the streetlights came on, right? So yeah. we went out <laughs> to the macro forest and, you know, I have no idea how we didn't get bitten by 
venomous snakes. Like right. you collected them. Like who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did step on Still a nail see a them when you go there. to get cut by oysters. So, you uh, know, I think yeah. tetanus shots were part of my annual boosters, not just the 10 year <laughs> plan. But yeah, so I grew up just being completely enamored. And it, it, what's interesting is that even back then, turtles and tortoises were part of my life. There were people who would come out there to the estuary and find turtles and tortoises and bring them back. And they would store them under their car along the dirt road. And we would wait for them to go back in the woods to look for another turtle or tortoise, whatever it was that they were collecting, different species like soft shell and all sorts of stuff, terrapins, and climb under their cars and then pull the tortoise out and then let them go like in our backyard and then wait till they'd left, right? <laughs> so yes. I've been kind of saving turtles since I was a kid, right? But I mean, yeah, climbing under people's cars, what was I thinking? But yeah, that's just <laughs> how we did it and played outside all the time. And um, yeah. I have, awesome. I, have, I love it. So when you decided to go to college, you, you knew that you wanted to do this program and I mean, yeah, you, did, like, I knew you I were wanted on a to do ship this. for one of your semesters, right? Yeah, I knew <laughs> I wanted to do biology and I knew that I was interested in conservation. I knew I was interested in marine sciences. I wasn't necessarily interested in the marine sciences in the capacity where I think some folks are like really driven by whales and dolphins, the sharks, right? The charismatic yeah. megafauna, even though turtles fall into that category, it's just driven by the whole thing. And uh, yeah, so I went off to school and I haven't always been the bestest and brightest of students in terms of academic performance on exams and tests and things like that. And so I found the process of, you know, taking those tests to get into colleges really to be a challenge because it wasn't my forte. And so I kind of went off to one of the first schools that said yes to me. And while I was there, I saw a poster on the wall, which I'm guessing now would probably be like a Facebook post, right? But there's a poster <laughs> on the wall about a semester at sea and you filled out a little business card and no postage required, right? And <laughs> mailed it off and, um, you know, and did this whole application process by mail called a semester at sea from Long Island University's Southampton campus. Yeah. And I got accepted. So I did a semester where we sailed a schooner from Maine to Haiti. And then afterwards, I was really enamored with Haiti. So I stayed in Haiti for a little while and um, yeah. <laughs> okay. If y'all can see Nick's face right now. Wow. <laughs> That's so wild. So like, so you, did you just like, is it, did this what sparked your travel bug or did you already have a travel, travel no, bug? No, no. My parents here? were definitely, yeah, my parents were definitely, yeah. It's Friday. Let's get in the car and go camp. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, and I've carried that. Through, yeah. Yeah. The only pause in my travel history was the first six weeks of life after my first child. And then after he was six weeks old, we packed him up and went on our way and we continued <laughs> that whole, yeah. So we've taken our kids everywhere, but, but that's sort of the travel thing, how it's wrapped up into my work. It's wrapped up into my research. There's quite a few vacations that weren't necessarily vacations, but it was a work trip. And then we also did a 10 mile hike, right? Because we were there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but it's also like the family focus, right? We haven't really necessarily invested in going to football games together or to a concert or something else. It's sort of our family thing. And I've kind of passed it on, I guess, pretty well to my kids. Yeah. That's really cool. I mean, you know, we usually ask when, when we know we have a traveler on um, the most unfair question, which is, you know, what's your favorite place you've ever been? And so um, I'll give you two seconds to stall. So, I mean, it's just one of those things that the joy of traveling is honestly right. just you know, maybe maybe it's the next trip every time. Yeah, right? it no. usually is the next trip, right? But, but yeah, gosh, I think every place I've been is my favorite. But if you're asking me to pick, my most recent favorite is my trip to Antarctica that I'm just now home from about two weeks ago. <laughs> and then, but that was a trip, right? Again, like research space. trip, and without my family. But with my family, yeah. I would say we enjoyed Peru and we went to Machu Picchu, but. Topping Machu Picchu was Lake Titicaca. And oh, I really? just think that that is probably one of the most fantastic, fabulous places I've mm. ever been on the planet. I yeah, just completely true. enamored with the people who live out there on the Reed Islands, the entirety of that lake. It's just phenomenal that this body of water exists at that elevation and the critters that live in it and the people that live there and make it their home. It's just really, really incredible. Wow. And I was, you know, it's funny. Like I, so I, I went to Machu Picchu. I did that as well. And I remember going there, like, I'm sure this will be fine. And then once we got there, it was incredible. Like it blew my yeah. mind. Yeah. There's all these people around and you have no idea. You can be at the far end of that thing and no one's near you. And yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Distance. We really enjoyed so We did me, the hike and the climb and all, yeah. and it was really amazing. But yeah, then we got a $10 bus ride and, you know, took it whatever, yeah. six or eight hours down to, to spend a few nights on Lake Chitikaka. It was just 
And that's even more incredible, man. Oh, now I'm jealous. I didn't do that. Okay. All right. You have to go. Well, there's always yeah. a reason to go yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. It's always but, um, uh, I mean, tell us about Antarctica. I know that's, so like one of my goals, I am, you know, and I think it's Laura's too, actually, is to see like all 50 States, all seven continents. Right. Mm -hmm. So how was Antarctica? What was that like? Cause that's, you know, most people don't get to do that. That's Correct. Yeah. It's impressive. It's really, and you've uh, been more than once now, right? No, I went to the Arctic, so I've been to. Both okay, okay, now. yeah. So, um, which even better? <laughs> cool. So this I've is been to uh, both ends. right. I've been to both ends. It's really impressive. You know, I think that there's sort of like this childlike wonder about the fact that I don't know. I think people kind of tease me about it a little bit, but I really just became completely enamored with the fact that I had to fly to Texas and then fly. 10 hours south, right, to get to Argentina. And then you get out of a plane and you get in a smaller plane to get to Ushuaia, which is, you know, another three and a half hours away. Mm -hmm. And then it's still two days by boat, you know, <laughs> yeah. to cross the Drake Passage wow. to get down there. You keep yeah. thinking like, I mean, because I'm a traveler, right? So I've been a lot of places. I've been on a lot of long plane rides. And but this is just epically long and it's arduous to get there. I'm completely, you know, thankful and privileged that I got to have this experience. But I spent a lot of time in the moment thinking about, you know, with modern travel, it still took me a heck of a long time to get there. It was a lot of work and how people managed to get there prior in 18, whatever. And I have all this, you know, fancy gear that keeps yeah. me warm and is lightweight and right. They yeah. knitted together something from sheep's wool and, you know, animal hides. And here I am. Right. It's definitely pretty yeah, impressive. That book so, trip too. Is it dangerous? How was it scary? The Drake scary? Passage is, uh, yeah. so there's the, the references, you either get the Drake Lake or the Drake Shake. And so <laughs> Drake Shake is more like a blender. And um, yeah, we had pretty moderate Drake Shake. So I'm honored and privileged and proud to say I did not need any of the little bags taped all over the walls <laughs> inside the ship. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I did okay, but you never know. Sometimes I just sneaks up on you but yeah so i was really impressed with the the work to get there the effort to be there and be present and then i was impressed by the people who literally have probably docked for you know hundreds of years in ushuaia and some other places and thought there must be something further right that drive to go explore further and to be able to kind of follow along in those footsteps through the beagle passage and then across the great passage to get there it's impressive yeah that experience is yeah in and of itself part of the voyage and it's not something that I necessarily ponder every other time I've traveled. So I really took mm -hmm. that in this time. It's a little interesting to try and get a perspective when you're there. Things are so large, but there's no other structures or there's no tape measure out there, right? To let you know that this is extremely high and tall. And then it's interesting to be with other scientists who are all experts in their craft and to learn all the things that we're able to learn about what's affecting climate change and to see it through their eyes and their understanding having, some of them have been eight, nine, 10 times. And so to have their expertise and then to be able to get in the water, you know, don all that gear and get in the Sorry, water. And, yeah. Get in the water? It's yeah. cold. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> it is cold. Well, but um, I've been in several cold places. So yeah, putting on all that gear in the dry suit and then getting in to see what's under there. It's quite impressive. Under the ice? Mm-hmm. You went under the ice too? Well, not, not, I'm not talking like ice oh. sheet and we dug a hole and went on dry. Gosh, you're giving me heart attacks over here. <laughs> but, but no, there's definitely lots of, I don't know, kind of like some days diving in a slushy or a slurpee. I don't know. Whatever, <laughs> wow. whatever icy, right? That's probably yeah. a regional name. Yeah, for yeah, it, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like ice slurpee. in a blender. Slurpee. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a brand here, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that so. challenging then to dive in that like, where you can't really see very far in your? Mm, no, I think that for those folks who dive and enjoy that kind of habitat, I think it's just so impressive. I think the only disappointing thing is that you eventually have to get out. Yeah, right. there's tons of gear too, right? Lots of thermal stuff you can wear, stuff you can plug in and heat your inner suit up and you can stay. Yeah, we've definitely scientifically engineering wise, dive equipment wise, we've worked that out. So you can make it pretty comfortable <laughs> for people to stay. Yeah. in the water for a pretty extended period of time. And you know, I guess, you you know, in actuality, you're probably just limited to by what your carrying capacity is for your your tank and things like that. How fast you're going to breathe. But I guess right. it might mean <laughs> difference if you saw something like an elephant seal coming at you. That might be. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> or a leopard seal. Goodness. You know, oh, that's really cool stuff, though. I love I love that. And I don't know. Like, how does that. So how does it compare to kind of like what you did in the Arctic? Is I mean, Obviously, they're very, very different. You know, even. Yeah. So. Cold. 
in the art, right? Both cold, both ice, both icebergs, both some charismatic megafauna. Um, I got to see lots of polar bears in the Arctic. In the Arctic, you know, we've people, not not necessarily us, but indigenous people, Inuit, have inhabited the Arctic for a really long time. And so there aren't any people in Antarctica. Nobody's ever inhabited that continent. And so getting to work and learn from Inuit people in the Arctic was really quite the treat. Eye-opening. I learned so much about our planet and our perceptions of things that we've learned about conservation, right? I think that I grew up in a generation where it was reinforced that people were eating and slaughtering seals and all sorts of horrible things were happening, but you know, none of that is actually really true. People were living and surviving and people here hunt animals and use them for food and all that sorts of things. And so, yeah, obviously baby seals are cuter than, I don't know, baby possums maybe, but um, you know, in terms of nutritional value or need for life and sustenance, it's all equal. So yeah, really, really eye-opening for what people do there to sustain and live and how they move. It was very interesting to learn from people in the Inuit communities about how climate change has affected their perception of places and spaces and where they live and what they do. You know, when you're used to navigating by mountain ranges uh, that are no longer there, it's just exposed rock, you know, because it used to be covered with ice and snow, that sort of changes. And if you've had a verbal history about what an area looks like, and then now you go back and the verbal history is that, oh, it's green and it has brown rocks when it used to just be, I don't know, seven mountain peaks. That's such a change in historical documentation, family communication, conservation, all those sorts of things. So it's a pretty big deal. So, yeah, you mentioned too. So, so both times you, the research that you're doing is uh, related uh, around climate change and everything like that. So it, in the, that? in the bigger picture, both expeditions were focused on climate, but my component in the Arctic was working with the little underwater robotics kits that I've been working with for most of my career. So I, I used um, some different grant funding and supported bringing ROV kits to Inuit communities. And then we provided educational materials and the kits to those communities so they can choose what to do with those kits. Part of my fascination is kind of carried throughout my career, right? Like in Guyana, I became fascinated with this group of people who didn't get told some instructions, right, by somebody else about what to do for conservation. They were choosing things on their own, which is how it should be. And so the same thing with a lot of science that goes on around the planet, sometimes you go into spaces and in people's places where they belong and then tell them how to do things. When actuality, we should just kind of share our knowledge and then say, here's the gear or the equipment that we have, and you can choose to do what you want to do as well. And so that was sort of my role in the Arctic, right? Is to bring my underwater robotics gear, provide it as educational material, provide educational material to and lessons to instructors, and then let them carry out and use it in an efficient way that's reasonable for them or not efficient but maybe effective way for for them yeah well, that's that sounds and i don't know what those answers are right because those aren't my choices that gets right. to be right so yeah so i mean that, that's, that's that's really cool to hear it's like i say that sounds very progressive it's really really that's interesting. a continual yeah. thread throughout my if you're looking for a commonality i suppose right that's a continual right. thread throughout my career right knowledge is power and we should all share it that's fascinating because there's so many different ways you can you can go from there but like uh, success stories, I guess, like where, you know, you've come to an area, you've shared some knowledge too, and, and how the community has adapted, changed over time. Do you have like examples of that or some, some, uh, um, examples? Of- well, I think that the continued work in Guyana, which isn't necessarily, you know, my work was really sort of documenting that and then providing a little bit of education in, in school groups there. That's still ongoing, right? The people there, They've learned from other scientists throughout the years and got connected to resources. So they tag and track the sea turtles that are coming in and they provide education to other native peoples and indigenous groups about, you know, if you're eating all of the eggs, then there's not going to be some turtles next season um, or the season after or however many hundreds of years it might take for the process to, to restart. There's education still ongoing there about what are some alternate protein choices turtles make a really great food source. We've talked about them from my childhood. It's why people were collecting them. People still eat gopher tortoise, even though that's highly illegal. But, you know, in terms of seafaring people from ancient times, maybe those going to Antarctica, if you caught a sea turtle, you could flip it on its back and it would stay alive, sadly, for a really extended length of time. Mm. And, you know, that's um, kind of gruesome to think about. But in terms of 
a protein source you didn't have to refrigerate or care for or cure. A turtle has made a global impact, right? About how, what people have done. So, so yeah. changing that mindset in Ghana, that's still going on. And there's not just sea turtles that are being eaten, but, you know, spurred tortoises and all that kind of stuff. So that work is still successfully happening and people are learning and looking for other sources of easy to use and grow protein. So yeah, that's an example. And then there's plenty of groups that I've worked with in the United States. And I think the STEM Center project here with the Living Shoreline, where we've changed out, I don't know, just horrible plants like Brazilian pepper <laughs> that don't belong here. We put in mangroves and we've added <laughs> gopher tortoise burrows. And now we have all these animals that didn't exist here before. We have burrowing owls, which have never been documented on the property. And um, oh, cool. So there's all kinds of little, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, yeah. That, that's the best part of like field camera work with students is the excitement of what are you going to see? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's cool. a success story too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great segue into the next thing I want to ask about. So talk to us about the Center of Open Exploration. Like, What is that program and how do you, how are you? So C, okay. So C4OE is basically just a small nonprofit. I have a small board where C4OE.org is our website. And the idea is that we're there's nobody in it who takes a salary, but for those of you familiar with science and research and education and educational institutions, not necessarily the one that I'm at, but throughout the country, overhead is a portion of a grant that goes straight to universities. So across the board in the United States at most public education institutions, if a scientist writes a grant to do research could be on shoes, right? But you're asking for a million dollars and the overhead of your college is 48 or 52% you lose that first half of your funding. And that keeps the lights on at the college. It keeps people employed. It pays you know, for the accountant, all those sorts of things. That's a really large chunk of change, especially in science when you're trying to do some research. So scientists are famous for saving everything. And I have you know, milk jugs and all kinds of stuff around my office because don't throw it away. <laughs> we might need it for something. Um, so the idea behind C4E is that there are a lot of us who have these little side projects, right? The things that are near and dear to your heart that you want to protect and conserve. And so... Through our organization, through the nonprofit, we can write a small grant and then 100% of the funding or 90% if we need to cover some overhead, like an accounting bill or something like that, goes to that project. And so when there is a small grant, $5,000, $10,000, maybe to bring ROVs or, I don't know, educational material to a community, we can do that. And we've done that around the Great Lakes. We've done that in Saba Island. We've done that in Seattle, all over the place. And so without having a major overhead, this nonprofit allows us to run programming and funding those programming to their full extent possible. And then a lot of us just sort of, you know, volunteer or give our time out of the kindness of our heart, but it allows a lot of experts like those who are on my board to contribute to all sorts of science. And a lot of it is citizen science really based. So yeah, it's kind of like uh, you do a uh, very, a uh, little bit of everything is, uh, is what I'm hearing. That's what, it sounds, yeah. that's what it sounds like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But um, it, there are a lot of balls to keep in the air, but it's yeah. not like a basketball, a baseball, a tennis ball, and a golf ball. They're <laughs> all baseballs or something, you know, whichever one you want to pick, but they're all of the <laughs> right. same ilk, right? It's not, they're not. You the, talk unrelated. sports as bad well, as good as I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My only lament on the show. <laughs> so I'm a big <laughs> space nerd, right? I, I just, I think it's fascinating. I mean, you know, really, it's not fair to say I'm a science nerd and space happens to be just one of the things I like, right? Uh, yes. But I love it. But I heard that you were one of a team of four scientists who placed oh, an yeah. agricultural uh, experiment on a satellite or uh, on a space shuttle mission. On the actually, shuttle. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what's that about? Tell me about that. Oh, so when I first finished grad school and I was teaching college at Hillsborough Community College in Tampa, the call came out, you know, kind of like that poster on the wall with the mail in card. It was email back then. <laughs> anyways. Um, STS-95 was going to be the mission for the shuttle for John Glenn to return to space. And a big component of that mission, NASA had put out a request for proposals, was really trying to look at what are the potential for long-term space travel. I mean, we're, we're expanding on that every day now, right? So, But back then, they were looking at what kind of things could grow in a space station or in long-term space flight that might be, here we are back to sources of protein or different space foods. And so some colleagues and I who had done some aquaculture work together kind of wrote up a proposal with the idea that we could fertilize fish eggs in space. So you could keep the gametes apart until they were ready to meet. And then you could have baby (laughs) fish hatch in space and tilapia, which many people probably eat and maybe don't even know, 
But tilapia, you can essentially, if you look at tilapia farms online, you can put 10 tilapia in a bucket with an air stone and some water. And as long as water is moving over their gills and you're feeding them, I would never recommend this, but just to drive <laughs> home that point that they'll pretty right. much grow anywhere, right? They're, and people see them in lakes and ponds and streams and they've taken over habitats. They're, they're definitely a hardy fish. And so, yeah, they're farmed all over the world. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, but anyways, <laughs> yeah. So the idea was to see if we could get fish to hatch in space. So we did fish in space. I mean, the t shirts are great, be. right? Because if you're a Muppets yeah. fan, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. We're, we're making a movie called Fish in <laughs> no. Space like right now. This is no. the, the Yeah. And session. so, yeah, the other space nerd is the photographer here, uh, Clyde Butcher, the black and white photographer. He does the real oh, large. I and just Adam saw. Prince. Okay. We got to shout out his wife because Nikki. I've only ever my whole life heard of Clyde, Clyde, Clyde. And there's an exhibit at the Clearwater Library right now there with is. Nikki's photography in her um, colorized. Her. It's yes. awesome. So yeah, awesome. Yeah, she does amazing work. <laughs> yeah, but Clyde, I had met him a few times and done some other work with him. And I told him about this experiment. So he came and shot it on large format for me. So I have a really lovely picture of the mangroves and the space shuttle going up. And he came and camped with my family. It's pretty fun. That's awesome. So, yeah, pretty fun. So that's my my favorite memory of that is the success, obviously. And then um, afterwards, the fish and uh, went to live at museum they in say Tampa. John Glenn's house, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, right. <laughs> they went to to live at Mosey, the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa, when they're their first location. And then it was kind of cool because they had different, well, different babies, right? P one progeny, P two progeny, the whole genetic right complement. Uh, yeah. So there was a couple people who looked at, you know, what were the changes in their in their swim bladder and all those sorts of things, right? Because yeah. you're in microgravitational orbit. So how does that affect um, mm-hmm. their ability to orient themselves, right? Because fish use a swim bladder to stay upright. Yeah. Interesting. Ah, that's so cool. That's cool. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm going to be right. reading about this the rest of the day. So right. <laughs> <laughs> you knew there were apes in space, but you did not know about the fish. Fish, fish in her. space. Handed. Coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> telling you yeah but i would encourage anybody who's interested in fact i think that nasa just put another one up on their website they're constantly looking for folks with unique ideas about launching things into space whether that's you know (laughs) gardens there's the cube sets there's all sorts of stuff that you can participate in with nasa yeah and you know there's science drawers that go up and you know you get a little compartment and they're like your lab is this size by this size and if your experiment fits in there and we've got room, we'll send it up. And the cool thing is, is that there really isn't a cost, right? It's not like I had to raise a million dollars to try and figure out how to get my fish in space. NASA's like, hey, we got room. And so- That's cool. Oh, cool. Yeah, those opportunities are open for a lot. They have some that are even targeted at you know middle school yes. audiences. So I always try and keep an eye out for, for those posts. How right, cool. and for those of you wondering, I'm sure it's too small for a person to fit into, so no funny ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done that yet, so we'll see. <laughs> my uh, experiment is to send me <laughs> yes i can see now why you've been accepted into the explorers club is that something you have to apply to it's a little bit of both right you can apply but also typically you're you're asked or someone sponsors your membership and then encourages you to fill out an application and then you have two folks who are existing members you know forward your application and write letters to the board and then there's a committee that votes on accepting you or not accepting you yeah, very cool. Yeah, Tim Gallaudet was one of our past Explorers Clubs person and uh, amazing trips from him as well. Yeah, it was really fun on the recent trip to Antarctica. I think that there out of the 114 of us, I think there were 26, 23, 26 members. Really? Uh, oh, so it's nice. fun. We, uh, and this yeah. was um, the Explorers Club is also famous, infamous for flags, right? There's uh, 203 flags in existence. I think 190-ish, 197-ish are still in rotation. And so you can apply to have an expedition, be a flag expedition. And then all the flags are numbered. So a lot of them have been to, I mean, they've been all over the planet, right? Several of them have been into space and to all the highest peaks and the lowest points. And so we took flag 61 on this expedition. So it was really kind of fun. So everybody who's a member then stands with the flag and takes a picture. And it's pretty pretty interesting. And then you get to figure out where that flag has been and the other things it's accomplished or been with when it's something else has been accomplished. So the big part of the expedition in Antarctica will be in October with a film and a book series and some photo essays that go around traveling. Cool. 
to have you back to talk more about that in the future. Um, But now it is time for field notes. It's the part of the show where we talk to our guests about memorable moments doing work in the field, because that's one of the things that connects us all. And we encourage listeners to share your own stories using the hashtag field notes so that we can find them and read them on a future episode. And I know you have a million stories (laughs) and we've already talked about a couple of things, but I wanted, I know that, and these are just fun for people myself included just to hear sort of like the scary things that happen because they these weird crazy things happen and I know you have a really crazy one so I'll let you tell it my craziest one your scary one my scary one well my scary one um yeah my scary one is when I was working in Guyana is this the one you're referring to yep Mm -hmm. yeah so when I was working in Guyana in the northwest region that's a really remote region so not as remote as antarctica but we're talking 6 to 800 miles or so from the next civilization of real people with i don't know telephones <laughs> and so um because you work at night looking for turtles and monitoring nests you have really odd hours but late one afternoon into the dusk hours we saw some boats approaching the shoreline and so if you look at a map where guyana is in the orinoco river you can see that the, the coastline of Venezuela is not too far away. And just offshore, the only folks with big boats and lights would be drug runners. And so unfortunately, they saw our little campfire along the beach because we were going to be monitoring turtles. And they were having some sort of, I don't know, heated discussion, argument, <laughs> and um, decided to come ashore and drop off somebody that they thought that wouldn't be a part of their expedition anymore for whatever nefarious things they were doing. That didn't go over so well. And then so there was a person who came deceased. I'll keep it PG. It was pretty horrible. Um, uh, But then they invaded the camp with guns and things like that. So we spent quite a few hours trying to hide in the mud and under the mangrove roots um, (laughs) along the shoreline. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, although I survived and did well and I did not get shot, I did see people get shot and I saw some other horrible things. But then as a lasting memory, because of all the mosquito bites, I got malaria. So, oh, wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it took a while. So, my graduate work took a little longer than necessary because I had to recover from some of that. But, yeah. Um, and you were a like, student um, during this? Like, yeah, I was trying why? to. This is going to be my career. There. I know, right? This is like my third trip down there. And yeah. So, you know, and then there's no way out, right? Except a dugout canoe and a small engine to paddle for days. So, you have to. You have to hide and do the best you can. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. I it took a little. I mean, the, you know, malaria is not very fun, and it takes some time to recover from that. And I'm thankful for modern medicine and access to it and things like that. So, but yeah, you know, it was troubling for quite some time at night when I was sleeping. But um, oh, I can imagine for, yeah, for a long time. Imagine. But but yeah, I know. Like right now, well, thanks for sharing. I think it's one of those things. No, well, important. you know, something bad goes in. The- goes wrong in the field for us we can say well it's not as bad as erica's story nobody died <laughs> nobody. No, but there's always that joke right about how bad is it nobody died right. i'm like yes but a lot of people but did sometimes yeah <laughs> sometimes but i mean you know you also so are this. resilient you know you came back and you know you, yeah, you have a long career afterwards where where you could have said well you know what i'm good <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> good done so yeah, i think that's so really impressive and, and i think, I think it keeps me um nowadays i'm like well it's not that scary because I know scary now, right? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Like to... Well, but I also, I usually try and remind myself that sometimes it is best to do things still afraid, right? Because it keeps you on your toes, um, keeps you aware of your surroundings, keeps you cognizant of the things that could possibly go wrong and that not everything or every scenario is peachy keen, right? There's some nefarious things that can happen to you, so. And that's a great point. Like, I, I think... I don't worry about people who've never done field work before. I worry about people who have done field work long enough to think they know everything about how it uh, goes. Yes. And that's yeah. where you really get hurt. I mean, like, yes, right. young people, you know, new people can get hurt, but the yeah. really dangerous stuff is usually someone who thinks they know what they're doing. Yeah. Like the, hey, watch yeah. this, you know, kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or I don't need that safety equipment because I've done it a hundred times or whatever. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't, I don't need to put my boots on. I'm sure I'll be fine. Oh, great. <laughs> That's not me. I'm over safe. Yeah. We are running short on time, but I want to give you a chance to tell us a good story. Like maybe one of your opposite favorite stories. Opposite favorite story. Gosh, I have, I have so many. Um, I know. Hmm. In what genre? Favorite story about like life? Um, Let's take it back to 
to uh, Nick Envy animal encounter? Come on. <laughs> oh, that one's probably easy right now. It's probably the penguins. I mean, penguins are not right. I mean, when they're on <laughs> land, there really isn't anything better than this little, you know, yeah, wobbling yeah, yeah. little thing in a in a tuxedo coming straight at you. Um <laughs> It is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but to tuck your hands and not touch, because I'm just going to tell you right now, I wanted to reach with everything I had and swish them, <laughs> pick them up and put them in your jacket. And, you know, they, they lay down accidentally in the penguin poop or on the algae or along the shoreline in the sand and their little white chest is all, you know, covered in whatever. And you just want to do that mother thing, right? Where you lick your thumb and like, here, let me get that off and clean you, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, they're absolutely adorable, but I promise Scout's Honor, I did not, even though I wanted to <laughs> touch one or interact with one, they're just really a phenomenal, amazing, really, really amazing little critter and that they're, that they're so curious. And there's probably a lot of people who are listening who are very familiar with that meme that was generated, I don't know, maybe 2015, maybe a little earlier, where there's a scientist who are, I think they're drilling into the ice and there's a little penguin behind him and the little caption is now, yes, I'd like to science, please. <laughs> um, so there, there are, but that is, but I think that's their whole personality. They're just kind of curious and they come right up and what are you doing? Yeah. What do you look up? Hey, how are you? <laughs> that's I'd cool. like to, I'd like to do this. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And not a creature. Hey, can creator. I try? <laughs> yeah. 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 And you want to let them. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Last thing, like we talked about, we met kind of over a women in STEM thing. And I know that you do work with girls too on some of these trips and research and stuff. Yep. What give us a takeaway, something for young women starting their careers to help them succeed? Maybe don't listen to any of the naysayers who have said all those horrible things in the past that I still hear sometimes today, but you can do it all. You maybe can't do it all in the same day. And some days certain things are going to get 100% and some things are going to get, you know, 0%. And then some days are 50 50 on all things. But life is this really cool long marathon and there's time and space for all the things that you want to accomplish, whether that's in your personal life or your professional life. And you can also switch gears and find out that maybe again, field work isn't for you and you want to do more lab work and, and it's okay. And then any opportunity you have to lift other women up, do so, right? It's not a competition and there's plenty of space for everyone at the table. And being able to to work together has been one of the greatest gifts in my career. Meeting other women in science and getting to partner with them on things has just been really fantastic. That's awesome. I love all of that. And you are living proof because you have got the family and the travel and the career and the lagoon outside your office window. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate one upper. We've got a lagoon. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So that's we're out of time. But is there anything else you want to talk about that we didn't touch on today? No, I think this was really fun. I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk with you guys today. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Last, last thing, where can people get in touch with you? So you can reach me. Uh, my email address is fine. It's my first name, Erica, dot my last name, Molten at gmail.com. You can also find me on social media at c4oe.org, which is also on Facebook. Or you can look up the STEM Center on Facebook at SPC STEM Center. That's our Facebook page. And there's, you can find me any one of those ways. Awesome. Thanks, Erica. It was, yeah. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was fun. Thanks. And that's our show. Thank you, Erica, for joining us today. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. See you, everybody. Bye.